So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome for this uh, public lecture by Professor Boris Shryman of the Cowley Institute for Theoretical Physics of the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, Professor Shryman is uh, visiting Bangalore in connection with the uh, joint ICTP ICTS program in biology, the first of its the first such program is a school that we have just having, and we are in the middle of it, on quantitative systems biology. So this school will also happen next year in Trieste and then come back to Bangalore and so on. So uh, Professor Scheiman is uh, visiting us in connection with that, and also in connection with the inauguration of the new center at the NCBS, which is the Simon Center. So. Uh, <coughs> I will not say very much more, but invite uh, Mukund Thattai to tell us something about Boris and his work. Thank you, Spenta. So, uh, uh, Spenta asked me to introduce uh, Boris, and uh, I feel honored to do that. Uh, though I, I do feel that I, I won't do it full justice because, uh, you know, I've known the biology side of Boris, not the physics side of Boris, and there should be two people up here doing the introductions. Um, then uh, also another thought occurred to me about the title of this uh, public lecture. This is a, a sure way to double the size of your audience, to call it an X's view of Y, because then surely you're at least going to get people from both those departments coming to see what's going on. Um, but uh, physics and biology are, are quite deeply intertwined here. So I first met Boris uh, in uh, 2001. I was doing my PhD in physics. Uh, I was in Boston and uh, trying to figure out problems to work on for my PhD. And, uh, working on statistical physics, and uh, then got interested in biology, started reading about it uh, by accident, and uh, uh, came across a, a paper about uh, signal transduction in photoreceptors. So basically how uh, a, a cell that is sensitive to light uh, converts the photon signal on top down to an electrical signal in the bottom. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a beautiful paper. I thought, this is exactly what I want to do. Um, I was already working with a, a group at MIT at the time, and so I asked my advisor, you know, can I go meet this person? So I wrote uh, to, to Boris, and he said, uh, come down. And he happened to be at Bell Labs at the time, so I drove down uh, in the summer of 2001. And uh, really, we've been collaborating since uh, that time on very, very many things. Um, so uh, Boris was uh, born in the USSR. He did his PhD uh, at Harvard and uh, after Harvard, uh, moved to Chicago, and uh, then moved to uh, Bell Labs, um, where he was a member of the technical staff. And uh, if you uh, don't know about Bell Labs, for those of you who don't know, this was at a time when you could be at Bell Labs, and there'd be one group of people working on uh, the things that uh, you know, the company cared about, and then the other group, which uh, could do anything they wanted. And so this was uh, a magical place to be. Um, and uh, while at Bell Labs, Boris has done uh, a huge amount of work uh, on very many topics, um, uh, including uh, uh, scalar turbulence and, uh, and uh, other, you know, core topics from uh, statistical uh, uh, physics. Uh, but uh, the important thing is that Boris was one of the uh, very early people in this sort of wave of engagement who transitioned from physics to, to biology and started working on interesting biological problems early on. Signal transduction I already mentioned later went on to work on tissue morphogenesis, population genetics, and so on. This happened while he was at Bell Labs, and later when he moved uh, via Rutgers to the Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, where he is currently a permanent member. Um, I, I won't go on much longer except to say that uh, uh, two years ago, in 2011, Boris was elected to the uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, of the United States of America. And uh, uh, in uh, uh, his position as one of the pioneers in this field, I think he's influenced a huge number of people across many generations and, and really given them the right taste to uh, approach uh, biological problems from a physicist's perspective. So, uh, Boris, welcome you to give this public lecture. Many thanks to all of you for, for coming, especially since this is... Uh, the second uh, public lecture for you this week. And uh, you know, the first one uh, being given by Professor Cuevedo, um, I think it was on Tuesday. 
And uh, uh, I dare say that uh, our two lectures perhaps uh, uh, could not have been more different. Um, now I was uh, talking about uh, um, you know, the theory of uh, the universe. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, fly wings. And he was talking about uh, big science done at the uh, enormous collider. And I'll be talking about uh, a little science that you can do with uh, pen and pencil and uh, in a small lab. He was talking about uh, the standard model or the theory of everything, which is definitely a theory with capital T. We had this discussion yesterday. And I'll be talking about uh, definitely a theory with uh, little t. But, uh, and actually there aren't too many institutions uh, in, uh, in, in the world that uh, would have uh, such different talks happen under the same roof, in the, under the same roof almost at the same time. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is really unique, unique special uh, um, feature of uh, um, ICTS, you know, this uh, broad view of, uh, of science. You know, we're all driven to specialize, but uh, the danger is that as we specialize, we'll also speciate and we'll no longer be able to talk to each other. So it's wonderful that there are institutions in, uh, in this world that uh, actually step, step up to prevent it from, uh, from happening. So, uh, so I said, you know, very, very, very different, uh, very different uh, uh, problems that, uh, that these two, two lectures are going to, to discuss. Nevertheless, I'm hoping to present uh, still some uh, grains of uh, intellectual unity, some grains of cohesion, some commonality of, in the pursuit of, uh, of theory, which uh, is something that motivates the experiment and gives us tool, tools to discover and tools to see something that is not obvious. So with, uh, with all that, let me just uh, jump in here. And, uh, well, you know, physicists like fundamental problems, um, you know, the theory of everything. And uh, in biology, of course, uh, there are profound and the fundamental problems. For example, you may wonder how, um, you know, my throwing arm here um, um, got generated in the process of uh, morphogenesis, in the process of uh, development, basically from the set of instructions coded in, the DNA, in DNA, right? So we're playing uh, this uh, very interesting executable that uh, somehow encodes in regulated uh, growth and uh, pattern formation, defines um, our structure and function ultimately. And uh, of course, another profound problem is uh, how this program of development itself came to be in uh, the process of evolution. And uh, so, um, going back to the theory of everything, uh, uh, so this process uh, covers uh, you know, the three billion years that were rather boring from the point of view of cosmology, right? But in the meantime, things were happening on, uh, on uh, the scale between, uh, what, uh, an angstrom and, uh, and a meter. So, um, okay, so physicists can get interested in this, but uh, we really have to confront the question. But uh, so what? What can physicists do? And uh, what's uh, worse, uh, what can a theorist do in biology? And uh, the question, why now? And uh, of course, people have been thinking in this direction for, for a long time. Darcy Thompson, uh, in particular, 100 years ago, uh, wrote a wonderful book where he uh, contemplated uh, um, interesting mathematical uh, uh, structures that are generated uh, by biological uh, growth. And uh, more profoundly, he was wondering how the form is generated by uh, uh, controlled growth. 
But uh, Darcy Thompson, right, 100 years ago, uh, I should hide this. Um, his work was really before, came before its time. So if you look at, uh, you know, Nature, which of course is a very authoritative uh, journal, uh, if you look at the milestones of developmental biology, they do not begin until 1924. Uh, and uh, actually, actually, Darcy Thompson is not on this uh, chart. Uh, interestingly, however, there is uh, an entry here for mathematical modeling, which uh, refers to Alan uh, Turing's uh, beautiful paper uh, on uh, the chemical basis of, of morphogenesis. So, interestingly, this uh, work was uh, much misunderstood, perhaps because uh, people expected that this has to be a theory, again, of everything. And uh, it clearly wasn't a theory of everything. And what was overlooked was uh, it was actually a theory of something. And in fact, it was a theory of many things. It was uh, not only it explained in uh, very simple terms, uh, in a very simple system, um, sort of reaction diffusion system. So um, I'm realizing that uh, I actually, right, we, we could talk for a long time about reaction diffusion. And, uh, and in fact, uh, we had uh, already a couple lectures in the course which uh, mentioned reaction diffusion. So anyway. His work comes up again and again now when we look more closely um, in developmental biology. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this Nature article makes an apology for it. Uh, it actually says that um, the role of this work uh, uh, is not universally accepted, but uh, um, uh, nevertheless, they think that uh, it belongs in this uh, among the milestones, and the fact that uh, it has now appeared as uh, one of the milestones itself represents the changing view uh, and the changing nature of, uh, of biology. So, uh, I'd argue that it's time to revisit Darcy Thompson's and uh, Alan Turing's um, agenda of trying to understand the growth and form with the full power, in fact, not, not just 20th century, but uh, 21st century developmental biology. And uh, so that's uh, my uh, answer to uh, this question, why now? The reason is that uh, biology itself is undergoing a revolution driven by uh, uh, the availability of a different type of data and uh, um, uh, interest in uh, um, uh, different class of, of questions. So, I was saying that uh, we, we have to specialize, so uh, <laughs> um, uh, Darcy Thompson's view was very, very broad, but uh, in uh, this talk, I will um, basically be focusing on uh, fly development. And just to remind you, so the fly starts off uh, in fertilized egg there, and uh, uh, rather rapidly goes through the period of embryonic uh, development, then uh, uh, emerges as a uh, larva, undergoes uh, most of its growth in uh, this larval stage, and uh, then uh, through um, uh, this period of uh, pupation, it metamorphs into an adult fly. By the time um, the adult comes out uh, uh, from the production line, it is a finished product. There is no development anymore. So all the interesting uh, development has happened in this early embryonic stage and during the larval stage. And that's what we're going to talk about. So, in, uh, so along that uh, list of uh, milestones, it's actually a good, uh, good read. You can uh, Google it up um, if you're interested. Um, uh, those milestones of development in, uh, in nature. Um, we've learned a great deal. So in particular, we learned um, the mechanism by which uh, this rather intricate uh, body plan of a fly, as well as other animals, is laid out. And it is laid out uh, here in, uh, the, at the end of the embryonic stage. 
And uh, here it is uh, rather visibly colorized so that uh, there is a uh, the, the, okay, the, 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 there is a segmented structure with different uh, segments giving rise to different adult uh, tissues. For example, this uh, T1 segment ends up as uh, uh, one of the legs. This turns into head and so on and so forth. And uh, the amazing thing that we now understand is uh, uh, that this body plan is laid out at the very beginning of embryonic development as a pattern of gene expression, this uh, beautiful striped pattern. Um, uh, so depending, right, of course, all cells have exactly the same uh, 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 genetic uh, uh, blueprint, the same genes, but uh, they express a different subset of genes. And that will eventually determine the fate of different tissues. And uh, what you see here as different colors are sort of master genes, transcription factors, which uh, tell the cells which uh, executable uh, of the development they should be turning on. And much of uh, that knowledge, um, there are quite, uh, quite a few Nobel Prizes uh, along the, uh, the way there. Uh, much of that knowledge was acquired by looking at uh, uh, sort of binary phenotypes, yes or no, big effects. So, for example, there are mutations which cause, which transform antenna here into legs. And one can actually figure out exactly which gene transforms uh, um, the developmental program that's supposed to be executed at uh, this particular position from make an antenna program into make a leg prob program, right? And this is a very binary decision. Antenna, I don't have any antenna, or, or leg. Uh, but if you think of actual difference between an antenna and, uh, and a leg, it is completely quantitative. It is shape. Well, now, <laughs> there are other things one can, can say about it. But, uh, so that, that was uh, my attempt to give you an example of uh, a distinction between a qualitative phenotype, a change from an antenna to a leg, to a very quantitative phenotype, the shape of a limb. So, the excitement is that now we have uh, a whole new class of uh, new types of data that are revolution revolutionizing the field of, uh, of, uh, of development. So now we can, uh, hmm, I hope you can, uh, you can see this. This is, uh, maybe there's a little bit too much light. Well, let's see. Uh, let me hope that uh, you're going to see this. We're going to uh, um, now get a glimpse of morphogenesis as a movie. So we'll be looking at uh, the first uh, five hours of fly uh, uh, embryonic development sped up. So rest assured, it will not take uh, five hours. And uh, so what you see here, or maybe you don't see it. So my first question is, can you see this? OK, terrific. So, what you see here is uh, the fly egg. It is uh, fertilized, and uh, oops, and inside there is a single nucleus, and the single nucleus here started dividing, and uh, uh, after undergoing nine rounds of division, the daughter nuclei are going to come to the surface, and now you start seeing these nuclei are on the surface, and uh, they continue dividing, and now you hopefully notice this wave of proliferation moving uh, 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 in from, uh, from the poles, and uh, the nuclei are packing more and more densely. So at this stage, things quiet down, and uh, the nuclei start making cellular membranes and uh, actually generating sort of proper cellularized tissue, and once they're done, the cells start moving, 
and uh, uh, make ooh. basically uh, it went a little bit too fast. We went through a so the process of gastrulation, and uh, uh, let me try to play it again. So I'll just cut to the chase here. So hopefully now you will see a little bit more slowly this motion of cells. Um, as they uh, sort of invaginate over here making uh, an inner tube and uh, then cells from here migrate onto the back. This is a process called convergent extension um, that we'll talk about a little bit. And uh, uh, this part of uh, the embryo uh, will give eventually rise to, to the head. And uh, so, and you can sort of see these striations here uh, corresponding uh, more or less uh, um, to the striated pattern that uh, will em eventually emerge. So this was kind of a black and white, um, this was a black and white movie. And uh, what we saw was not so much biology as uh, the physics of uh, biological objects. We saw formation of a lattice, but it was a, a lattice of nuclei. We saw waves, and these were waves of uh, cell division. And uh, we saw flow of cells. Um, but uh, coming soon, and in fact already exists, are these sort of movies that in addition have uh, fluorescent reporters for expression of various genes. So you can actually start seeing, uh, right in the beginning, we started with these uh, colored uh, um, uh, stills, right, Cover, uh, colored uh, pictures of uh, um, uh, patterned embryo. And soon we'll have uh, colored you know, movies in, uh, that will uh, actually allow quantitatively document the spatiotemporal dynamics of uh, gene expression. So we have uh, with this new kind of so like four-dimensional 3D plus time with this uh, four-dimensional data, we <coughs> have a new way of trying to address the question of uh, how to get from genes and molecules to uh, shapes and uh, microscopic uh, structures. So we can observe this developmental program in, uh, in action. And this developmental program involves uh, you know, cell proliferation uh, um, um, and uh, um, rearrangement, uh, cell differentiation. And all of it is coordinated by uh, intercell interactions and communications between, uh, between, between these cells. So for example, I tried to draw your attention to uh, this uh, process of uh, uh, so migration of cells from uh, the belly of the embryo onto its back. So what's really happening is uh, this uh, tissue elongates. So if you think of this as a rectangle, Right? It's going to be stretched in one direction, compressed in uh, um, the other direction. So it will do something like this. And uh, the way it happens is uh, through controlled rearrangement of, uh, of cells. So here you see these uh, blue cells that uh, um, do not touch the red ones. That, that, that's uh, the situation in the beginning. But uh, as the process uh, uh, progresses, cells kind of change neighbors. And uh, the blue ones move in next to uh, the red ones. And uh, that's actually the mechanism driving the, the elongation. So we'd like to understand, so how does this uh, uh, process happen? And we know a great deal of what's happening on uh, the smallest of scales here. Um, 
one can, uh, uh, so most of the action uh, occurs uh, at uh, the interfaces or in the surfaces of cells. And uh, we know molecular players there. We know that uh, um, there are proteins called uh, coherins, which uh, form kind of uh, a glue between different cells, adjacent cells. They make uh, uh, sort of molecular bridges uh, binding neighbors together. Uh, and uh, then uh, there is a cy cytoskeleton uh, of, uh, of the cell consisting of uh, uh, actomycin. So actin is sort of a structural polymer of, uh, uh, um, that gives cells uh, uh, their rigidity to the, to the extent that they have it. And uh, myosin, myosins are the motor proteins which uh, slide along on uh, actin and uh, generate uh, motion and generate uh, forces. And then, of course, there are uh, uh, receptors on cell surfaces and uh, there are ligands on cell surfaces so cells can talk to each other. And, uh, we know all that, but the question is, how do we go from uh, these uh, genes and molecules, um, in this case, uh, responsible for, you know, that, uh, <coughs> that I just described, and the morphological events, the rearrangement of, uh, of the tissue? What lies in between? And what lies in between is uh, the tissue and the dynamics of, uh, of the tissue. So there are these cells, and uh, um, we can try to describe these cells by their state. And uh, uh, now the whole thing turns into kind of a physics problem, right? Physicists uh, like thinking about uh, Lattices, so this is a particular disordered lattice for, to contemplate. Um, and uh, physicists like to uh, think um, of uh, relevant variables and uh, defining dynamics in terms of uh, rel relevant variables. And uh, they like interacting systems. They like uh, thinking about how um, um, neighbors and not, uh, not near, well, uh, how different cells uh, um, interact, move, and uh, rearrange. So I would basically, I present this to you as uh, a little physics problem. So, um, so my original plan was actually to think, uh, to think, to tell you not only about morphogenesis, but also about evolution. And uh, that, that's uh, what you may have read on, uh, on that uh, poster. I'm sort of realizing that uh, I can't uh, cover quite as much ground. So, You'll forgive me, I'm just going to skip uh, uh, what I was going to tell you about uh, evolution here um, and just proceed with morphogenesis, okay? So we're just going to dig in and uh, uh, continue this case study of uh, growth and form and uh, and in particular focus on uh, uh, wing development and uh, the question of how the wing uh, knows when to stop growing uh, or if you like how the wing, how the fly wing got its size. And I'm going to give you a physicist view of this which will basically be that uh, morphogenesis is not just genetics plus biochemistry but also a little bit of physics. And uh, 
Um, so let's uh, um, jump in here. OK, so I already told you how um, the body plan of uh, the fly is first uh, determined and realized as uh, a spatial pattern of uh, gene expression. And uh, uh, one of the things that we learned about uh, this is that uh, the, um, in this case, anterior-posterior coordinate that uh, defines which gene is going to be expressed where is uh, set by uh, um, a gradient of positionally dependent uh, concentration of uh, certain diffusible factors called morphogens. In fact, uh, um, the term morphogen uh, was coined by, uh, by Turing. And uh, so these uh, diffusible morphogens define uh, spatial coordinates in uh, the embryo. And I'm actually curious that uh, um, this idea of uh, morphogens as a uh, morphogen gradient setting the coordinate system uh, first appeared as uh, a theory, as a, a little uh, model called uh, <laughs> um, French flag model. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, introduced by Louis uh, Wolpert in England. And, uh, um, you know, so a very simple model basically saying that uh, if uh, um, expression of genes depends on morphogen concentration, then in different places, you will express different, uh, different genes. So some genes will require very high level of the morphogen, and therefore will be only expressed in this region. And uh, others can be expressed even uh, where there is very little. And then if there are some interactions, if they repress each other, then one can uh, make a striped pattern. And uh, that was introduced as an idea, as a little theory. And, uh, it uh, actually guided um, people's thinking and uh, remarkably was eventually discovered. Well, we'll be talking about uh, fly wing development instead, which uh, really starts uh, a little bit later, not uh, uh, so much in the embryo, but uh, in the larva. and. Uh, uh, of course, larvae don't have anything uh, uh, remotely resembling uh, wings, but uh, the tissue, which uh, is destined to become uh, the adult wing at that stage, is just a little disk of uh, uh, sort of a two-dimensional sheet of, uh, of cells um, called imaginal disk, and all the growth occurs uh, in that little disk. But there is a lot of uh, growth. The number of cells that expands by uh, uh, a factor of, uh, of 1,000. So this looks very different from, uh, from the embryo. But remarkably, the patterning of this imaginal disk is uh, guided by exactly the same um, general principle. It is uh, uh, the disk has its own, in fact, Cartesian coordinate system set up um, by uh, uh, so morphogen sources. Um, and uh, again, there are morphogen uh, gradients in this direction and in that direction. And uh, uh, different uh, levels of uh, morphogen then uh, um, um, uh, lead to expression of uh, different genes. So uh, this little pattern. Uh, um, I don't know which flag it's supposed to uh, resemble here, but uh, it is still governed by uh, the French flag principle. And, uh, and here's a surprise, right? Uh, uh, this, you know, biology is not supposed to be universal, but uh, here is one uh, sort of very simple idea, and it turned out to be quite general. And uh, it doesn't just work in flies. It works in, uh, in chickens and, uh, and, uh, and in mammals. And uh, this is a rather general principle. And uh, suddenly, 
maybe uh, this uh, uh, morphogen uh, theory uh, should acquire not a uh, little t, but uh, a capital T. So, well, it's nice to know this, but uh, um, we want to know more. We want to know how organisms coordinate patterning and, uh, and growth, and we also want to know how these limbs, wings, for example, know when they should stop growing. So, uh, so if you're thinking about coordination of uh, patterning and growth, it is rather reassuring to know that uh, uh, growth, you know, cell proliferation is actually driven by the same morphogens that are uh, driving the patterning. And, uh, um, and I told you that virtually by definition, morphogens form uh, so non-trivial spatial profiles. And uh, um, uh, very naively, you might think that, uh, um, well, that will sort of suffice to, uh, to uh, determine the size, because uh, where you have a lot of morphogen, you're going to have cell proliferation. And uh, when this uh, nice, pretty disk gets to be large enough, it, uh, so the cells get far away from uh, uh, both of the sources, then uh, cells get uh, no more growth signal, so they should just stop growing. Well, the only problem is that the cells close to the source of morphogen don't know about it. So um, what one needs is some interaction which would allow cells uh, uh, in the middle of the disk to find out how large the tissue is overall. And uh, well, this being biology, so of course, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, some sort of uh, chemical messenger or you know, receptor ligand uh, signaling. And, uh, um, for you know, the course uh, students who have been uh, uh, listening to uh, uh, Art Lander's uh, uh, two lectures, right, they will not fail to notice that I have uh, grossly oversimplified the situation with morphogens. And uh, it's not entirely out of ignorance. It's also with uh, uh, some purpose that uh, um, this level of complexity will suffice for now. So, um, and Art talked uh, a lot about uh, uh, chemical messengers, but if you're a physicist, you cannot uh, help but wonder if there could also be uh, a physical mechanism, or rather if there could be mechanical interaction involved. And uh, then, of course, the moment you start thinking that way, you uh, you realize, well, so suppose you have this uh, little disk and the morphogens are supplied, uh, you know, growth factors are supplied non-uniformly, so some part of the disk is going to start growing more rapidly than, uh, um, right, the center of the disk, is, will, cells in the center will start proliferating more rapidly than cells on the periphery, so what's going to happen? Well, obviously, they'll get rather crowded and they will start stretching uh, the, the surroundings. So I, I, I guess I have to uh, tell you that uh, uh, um, cells uh, in the epithelial tissue cannot flow very easily. They cannot uh, rearrange that easily. So they behave a little bit like an elastic, uh, or at least viscoelastic uh, solid. So, then you immediately think that uh, any non-uniform growth is going to generate strains and uh, stresses. And uh, uh, then you sort of start thinking about the implications of uh, uh, the spatially varying rate of, uh, of growth. And uh, you can write down some equations, but you really don't have to. Um, um, 
you can uh, pretty much hand wave, uh, uh, wave your hands uh, to uh, uh, a rather intuitive picture. So one way of not generating a stress is to have completely uniform graphs. And then you can uh, easily convince yourself that as long as uh, local growth is not equal to average growth, local pressure is going to increase. So now let's hypothesize for a moment that uh, local rate of growth not only depends on the position, but also depends on mechanical stress locally. And uh, let's make up a little, uh, um, so, so, um, you know, some dependence, some way that uh, local growth rate will depend on, on pressure. And uh, naively, you might think that uh, if the pressure is very high, right, uh, the growth rate uh, will go down. And perhaps if the pressure is uh, very low, or rather the tissue is under too much tension, you know, something bad is going to, uh, to happen. So perhaps there is some maximal rate of growth here. And uh, now, suppose that uh, locally this uh, rate of growth is higher than the average rate of growth. What's going to happen? So locally at this point, um, um, the growth exceeds the average, so the pressure locally will start increasing. And uh, what we're going to see is uh, that the local pressure will increase until the local rate exactly matches the, uh, the average rate. So very simple, very intuitive. But uh, this immediately provides us with, uh, again, Art was talking about it uh, uh, in the course today, with uh, sort of a very nice, uh, a very robust uh, feedback mechanism called uh, integral feedback and control theory, uh, which uh, sort of nicely, would nicely uniformize the rate of growth even if, in the tissue, even if uh, uh, the growth factor uh, growth factors are supplied non-uniformly. So, now let's uh, continue with uh, uh, building little toy models. Let's consider a little uh, uh, toy disk. Um, uh, so, patch of cells, and uh, let's supply morphogens um, uh, in uh, some uh, non-uniform fashion. We'll basically pick uh, a cell, declare that it's a center, and uh, so specify sort of an axisymmetric, so but non-uniform uh, uh, profile of uh, the morphogen. So we expect the cells here in the center of the cell will be proliferating more rapidly. And uh, as a result, we expect the pressure will build up here, and uh, the tension uh, will be uh, sort of compensating for it uh, on, uh, on the periphery. So now we can uh, uh, actually turn this toy model into a toy simulation. And now we, we, uh, we actually simulate the growth mostly happening here. Um, these black dots are cell divisions. And uh, uh, you see that uh, now this tissue actually has stopped growing. And what has happened is uh, it, has grew, it has grown large enough for the periphery of the disk not to receive enough morphogen, whereas uh, in the center of the disk, where there is enough morphogen, there is uh, too much compression and uh, no growth again. So uh, that was our little... Uh, um, idea for how size might be determined. And uh, uh, other people in uh, uh, Switzerland had uh, a similar idea. So uh, anyway, so we have this little toy model thinking that uh, mechanical feedback may be a, a factor in uh, controlling the growth. But uh, 
um, then we sort of have to come back to Earth, come back to reality and, uh, and biology. And uh, this little model didn't provide as many answers as it uh, supplied the questions, right? So the first question is, uh, well, you know, if there are these mechanical interactions, uh, can we actually quantify this? Can we observe these deformations that I just uh, uh, claimed? Uh, uh, does the stress of deformation actually affect the growth? And uh, um, most of all, our biology friends uh, want to know what is the molecular mechanism? So all we really got is uh, sort of a bunch of uh, new hypotheses um, to uh, try to test experimentally. But uh, the good thing is with a number of people thinking in that direction, um, our experimental friends uh, sort of started uh, um, looking at the problem as well. Um, so in Marseille, uh, uh, Loïc Ligoff and uh, Tamali Kui uh, um, took uh, a serious close look at uh, deformations of cells in uh, these wing disks. So um, one uh, looks at the, uh, uh, this disk. Now I'm showing you um, a kind of data. Well, um, it doesn't, you know, this picture doesn't really do it full, uh, um, give it full credit. But uh, anyway, so one can uh, uh, get pictures like this, uh, um, segment the image, determine uh, um, the shape of each and every cell, and uh, uh, then uh, look at the uh, distribution of cell sizes and uh, look at the uh, uh, deformations of cells. And uh, lo and behold, one uh, uh, actually sees the pattern um, of uh, so the consistent with compression in the middle of the disk and uh, uh, stretching of, uh, of, uh, of the periphery. Okay, so that's uh, encouraging. But of course, the big question is molecular mechanism. And uh, in the last, uh, I guess, uh, five years, um, so one particular molecular pathway came into into focus. And uh, um, so you see this uh, alphabet uh, soup here, and uh, I'm going to quiz you at, uh, at the end of the talk. So it is uh, evidently a complicated pathway with uh, many molecular players. And uh, uh, at present, we know our understanding of uh, these different inputs into this pathway is very, very limited. All we know is uh, that the output is uh, control of, uh, of growth. But uh, what was discovered very recently is uh, that actually one particular branch in that uh, pathway, um, one particular protein associates with uh, um, these so-called adherence junctions and uh, um, cytoskeletal cables uh, of the cell. And uh, they demonstrated that it actually responds to tension. So now we actually have a damn good uh, uh, molecular candidate for the mechanosensor responsible for um, um, this mechanical regulation of, uh, of growth. But there's still a missing link, right? We know that uh, applying uh, tension to, uh, to this tissue may stimulate growth, but what we don't know is that uh, um, uh, this mechanical stress generated by the non-uniformity of growth is actually the natural feedback. And uh, um, the big uh, problem in this whole study is uh, that it is actually very, very difficult to measure mechanical stress in, uh, in the live tissue. So one way that uh, people measure uh, uh, 
try to measure stress is by taking a live uh, tissue here. Well, it's uh, again epithelial layer in uh, um, uh, the fly, so uh, well, actually a pupa. And uh, they basically come in. This looks very dim to me, so I hope you can, uh, you can see. So one basically comes in uh, with a UV laser, uh, focuses it on uh, a, a particular cell-cell uh, interface and zaps it. And uh, then one, uh, uh, so having annihilated uh, this interface, one observes a little bit of uh, response, so local rearrangement of cells, and then one tries to interpret it. And uh, it's uh, quite non-trivial actually to interpret it, and uh, in any case, it's hardly a non-destructive way of, uh, of, of measuring anything. Uh, much better would be to have uh, um, uh, so the molecular, so the fluorescent molecular reporter for tension. And there are ways of, uh, of building such things. Um, um, people are working on uh, making nice reporters like that but uh, it hasn't quite happened. And we're theorists. We can't really make these, uh, these constructs, so what can we theorists uh, do? Well, what we have access to are these uh, really high quality, wonderful pictures of uh, the tissue. And uh, the question comes in, could we somehow, perhaps, be able to infer the stress here just by looking at, at the picture? And it's actually not so ridiculous, because uh, if you assume that this tissue is uh, um, in instantaneous mechanical force balance, and we have good reasons to believe that uh, most of the stresses are concentrated in these cytoskeletal uh, bundles that uh, run along interfaces. We know exactly where they are. So uh, the question is, just by observing the geometry of, of these cells, can we perhaps infer the local tensions and uh, pressures in, uh, in the cell? So we call this a mechanical inverse problem. And uh, um, um, I think I'm going to skip this. I was going to uh, run through uh, a little uh, argument here and uh, actually explain exactly how uh, luckily it turns out that in this inverse problem, the number of unknowns, which are the tensions and pressures everywhere, uh, happily turn out to be equal to the number of constraints. And the constraints is we know that the force at every vertex has to, has to vanish. And all of that happens thanks to Mr. Euler here. Um, but uh, just take my word for it. Uh, we can, uh, at least in silico, we can uh, solve this inverse problem. You know, there, 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 there's some small print there and uh, there, there there's some additional assumptions that go in, but let, let's get back to the data. And uh, now, um, look at the data where not only we, so that, that's uh, part of that technicolor uh, type of data, where not only we're looking at the cells, and this is actually a still from a movie, but we're also simultaneously visualizing uh, local concentration of uh, myosin that uh, molecular motor associated with the cytoskeleton and local concentration of uh, cadherin, uh, which is the cell-cell adhesion module, right? And now we ask, so very naively, you might think that uh, local tension should correlate with the uh, local abundance of, uh, of myosin. And uh, that would perhaps not surprise uh, anyone, that's what we expect, but we also have uh, another goal. We can't directly measure tensions, 
And we need to know that whatever our algorithm, mechanical inverse, is spitting out is not noise. So that's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to run our algorithm, algorithm, infer local tensions in each and every edge here, and then try to correlate this with uh, abundance of uh, demisen. And pardon this uh, technical uh, uh, slide here. So we can uh, look at, uh, in this case, cumulant distribution function of uh, the tension, of the correlation of uh, tension and misen. So this is just the integral of the probability distribution. So uh, for if we sort of randomize uh, the edges, uh, that will provide us with a control set. In the control set, there is no correlation. So this thing uh, 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 at the half point, um, which would correspond to the peak of the distribution, more or less, uh, uh, we have no correlation. But when we do this for the, for the real data, we actually have a fair bit of correlation. We have uh, uh, um, uh, a rather healthy and statistically significant correlation. So that somehow tells us that uh, we do have signal. Of course, this correlation is, uh, is very far from perfect. And uh, how could we even dream of uh, having a very accurate measurement uh, just by looking, looking at, the, at the picture? But uh, once you get a little handle, once you get the end of, uh, of a string, you can try to pull it, right? Uh, the moment you have some signal, you can try to get more out of it just by getting more data. So, and uh, we can, uh, uh, we have no shortage of, uh, of data. So we can start uh, uh, asking questions that we don't necessarily know an answer to. So, uh, we have tested the hypothesis that myosin, so tension is portion. Theory as a, as a tool, uh, part of the story. Um, now, by having a model there and being able to parameterize the effect, we can. Uh, uh, basically look for the value of the parameter, in this case, the contribution of coherent to, to tension, such that uh, the observed correlation in, uh, in our analysis increases, right? And the more data you have, so n here is a number of cells, the more signal you get out. And uh, suddenly, um, we actually learned something. We learned that uh, coherent contributes and uh, contributes negatively. Perhaps not so surprising because uh, right, it's uh, adhesion, so this is like wetting, so again, uh, good old physics. But, uh, but what we have here is uh, uh, by uh, so suitable quantitative analysis of uh, rather lousy data, if we have a lot of it, we can uh, uh, um, uh, measure with uh, rather unexpected, unexpected accuracy. So I think it's time for me to wind up. So I think this, uh, this is a, a, as good a place as any. So <laughs> let me just summarize. So I presented a little uh, story to you here about the role of mechanics in uh, uh, morphogenesis. And uh, it started as uh, a theory. And, uh, and this little theory motivated uh, a bunch of experiments from which we learned a great deal. Okay, you may not be terribly interested in uh, so the stresses and uh, deformations in uh, um, uh, these uh, wing disks. And uh, um, the work isn't finished yet. So 
we still need to put together what we just uh, is uh, literally uh, um, is uh, sort of discovery of the last uh, year. Um, so we really need to uh, put things together and uh, actually try to demonstrate that uh, um, this mechanical feedback is regulating growth in, uh, in, uh, in the disk. And uh, so this is, uh, I'd say, well, so definitely not the end of the story, but uh, some progress. And uh, the curious thing is, uh, uh, along the way, it uh, became, uh, uh, well, it was obvious, I think, from the very beginning, uh, that, uh, you know, this original toy model that uh, I just presented you with is uh, um, most probably wrong and uh, uh, certainly incomplete. But uh, nevertheless, I would uh, try to argue that uh, with these uh, uh, incomplete and possibly wrong models, uh, one can make progress as long as uh, um, um, uh, they can stimulate new experiments and new thoughts. So I'll just conclude that uh, the real problem for a theoretical physicist in biology is uh, that there are too many fun problems. And, uh, and uh, for a real conclusion, uh, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to acknowledge you know, these wonderful uh, uh, people that uh, um, I've been working with, um, both experimental uh, uh, collaborators and uh, uh, postdocs and uh, students uh, at uh, KATP. So some of them, uh, or many of them, have moved on. So the work that I talked about, uh, uh, so the original model was done with Lars Hupnagel, uh, uh, who is now a group leader at Emble and Heidelberg. And uh, my student, Kevin Chu, moved on to uh, UPenn. Uh, we did uh, mechanical inverse with him. And uh, there is a current generation of postdocs and uh, students uh, at KATP. And uh, 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 I talked a little bit about uh, this more recent work uh, of Madavs and, uh, and, uh, and Nix. But, uh, um, but the whole uh, crew has contributed intellectually and uh, um, technically to everything that's going on. So, uh, Sid uh, Goyal here in the audience is a member of uh, the current KATP crew, but unfortunately not for much longer. He is moving on to uh, um, Toronto. And uh, um, thank you very much. I would invite, uh, while uh, Mukund is uh, looking for, for the mic, yeah, uh, we got it. I think uh, we okay. have a few we minutes have time for questions. For questions. Yeah. So, uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. so uh, in uh, your model of mechanical feedback, when you have non-uniform stresses and strains, is there a possibility of out-of-plane buckling of the, of the layer? Absolutely. And, and is, is it taken care of in...? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> it's not taken care of. So, uh, uh, so it doesn't happen in uh, sort of the bulk of, uh, of the disk, right? Okay. Um, but uh, you actually see it on uh, the periphery, and uh, you can try to... Uh, well, you can understand it actually quite easily. Uh, so they're kind of um, circular folds, and uh, uh, this is exactly what you expect under tension. So, basically, right, if you take saran wrap 
and you pull on it, it makes ridges. So this is a, a kind of instability uh, uh, in a sort of very thin uh, sheet under tension. Thanks. Uh, two small questions. One, is there a rule of electrostatics in this problem? Because they have the charge on the surface. Well, so, you know, electrostatics uh, runs uh, sort of much of uh, biochemistry on uh, small scales, right? And it's the charges on proteins that ultimately control the folding. Uh, no, but in this control. problem, when... Well, you know, it's all full of water. So uh, uh, electrostatics is screened uh, on a 20 nanometer scale. And, uh, you know, this thing is uh, uh, 100 microns. Okay. Second thing is that many of your pictures are, uh, they remind of jamming in a 2D deformable disks where people talk of force chains and so on. So are there messages from that field to this uh, field? Yes, I think so. Uh, <laughs> um, um, in fact, once you sort of start thinking about the mechanics of cells in these uh, disordered uh, uh, arrays, uh, there are very direct parallels. And uh, um, in fact, uh, the assigned reading to uh, my student Kevin uh, when he was uh, doing this was uh, you know, some very nice papers of uh, Mathieu Bayard, maybe you know, on uh, uh, modes in uh, uh, granular media at jamming. Yeah. So, in fact, this thing behaves very similar to a uh, um, system exactly at jamming. So local stress develop, uh, what is the time scale of relaxation of local stress compared to the time scale of the growth rate of the cell? Um, it's a very good question. So uh, the guess is, uh, uh, comp comp well, maybe I didn't quite, uh, uh, quite catch it. So what was the question? You said uh, lo uh, local, local rearrangement. Uh, you're asking about local rearrangement. Local cells. mechanical stress developed due to non-uniform growth. Well, it, so it the, 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 in order to really get rid of uh, of the stress, you you have to rearrange the cells, right? And uh, um, in the disk, there seems to be very little rearrangement aside from. Uh, whatever is caused by self-proliferation itself. So our best guess at the moment is that most of the rearrangement is happening, is mediated by cell division itself. So the guess would be that uh, um, the time scales are comparable. Hello. Uh, so different animals develop very differently. So different animals develop very differently. So how that is incorporated in this kind of model. So where exactly the plants differ? Uh, very, uh, very interesting. So uh, plant cells are very different in the sense that uh, they're rigid, they're under tugger. Um, 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 but uh, it certainly does look like uh, mechanics plays uh, uh, a role rather big time. So there is very interesting work uh, done at, Cal well, I guess Elliot Merovitz used to be at uh, Caltech. Uh, maybe he still, uh, maybe he came, okay. Anyway, um, and, um, oh my God. For my friend uh, in uh, France, um, Terribly sorry, I'm blanking on the name. This is very embarrassing. Arietsky? Yeah, Arietsky, thank you. Um, actually looking at what's happening in the uh, growing plant shoot. And in fact, going back to uh, uh, um, Darcy Thompson, right, and before Darcy Thompson, 
so the question of uh, problem of philotaxis, right? These uh, Fibonacci spirals that one sees everywhere uh, that are uh, attributed to the packing. But uh, uh, um, uh, it basically looks like uh, uh, it's mediated by uh, sort of stress. Uh, it, it, okay, it's a little complicated. I, I guess I shouldn't have tried to uh, go into this in detail. But it's different, but uh, yes, mechanics plays a role, and people are studying this both experimentally and theoretically. That's how I should have. Okay. So, uh, fine, we'll take that as one, one last question before we finish the proceedings. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have just uh, about uh, two to three uh, comments. I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Uh, uh, firstly, I would like to uh, just draw your attention that uh, two developmental psychologists, Esther Thelen and Linda Smith, uh, have tried to develop, uh, develop a dynamical systems theory of development. Okay. So that's very interesting because uh, I mean development uh, tends to occur late into uh, adulthood. And uh, it happens in a fairly kind of, uh, on an average, a fairly precise way, like uh, the timing of Minarche and uh, so on. So the question that they raised is uh, how can we kind of model uh, the interaction? Let's say genetic regulation, there are, there's a static information in the DNA, but uh, how does it get, uh, you know, decoded in a, in a dynamic kind of way uh, with such precision leading to, uh, you know, kind of morphogenesis and precise organs. So if you could comment on that. And the second uh, just uh, point is how, uh, actually I read in the poster that you were also, uh, like you might have intended to present something on evolutionary theory. So uh, uh, how could that be done given that, uh, you know, some uh, uh, scientists like Popper, if I may call him a scientist, or philosopher, they, they, they are of the opinion that theory of evolution is not a theory at all. It's a kind of a metaphysical kind of speculation because you cannot recreate uh, the evolutionary history. Much of it is unknown in laboratory settings. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, very good. So the, the first question in, uh, in a very limited way was, uh, exactly what uh, I was trying to, uh, to tackle, right? And uh, uh, right, it's a very big question of how to actually go from, uh, uh, you know, DNA all the way to uh, the adult, right? So we have to cut it into smaller pieces and, uh, and try to tackle it, right? And, uh, uh, reduce the problem to a, a sort of more manageable size, be it embryonic development and the development of a pattern in the embryo, about which we understand a great deal on the level going all the way down to DNA, as we know exactly which genes express when and uh, activate what next gene there is to be expressed. So we are on the right track. Going all the way to, uh, to, uh, to adulthood is, uh, is another story. Uh, now, uh, so moving question. on to the second loaded so question. I'll uh, uh, reinterpret briefly. Do you believe that evolution and cosmology are testable scientific theories? <laughs> well, um, uh, and cosmology. Uh, let me, let me just deal with the, uh, I'll uh, defer cosmology to, uh, to Spencer, yeah. But uh, uh, let me try to deal with, uh, with uh, evolution. Not only it is testable, it has been tested. And it has been proven right. Because uh, it was conceived on uh, the basis of uh, comparison of uh, morphological forms and uh, 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 beaks of, uh, of finches, it made uh, a profound and non-trivial prediction of uh, common ancestry and relatedness. And uh, 
Uh, now, we have different tools. We have genetic uh, tools to ascertain relatedness. And uh, um, we have sequenced a lot of genomes and uh, recovered this uh, relatedness on genetic level, which has been predicted. So, um, I think the theory uh, has passed the test with flying cover colors. So, thanks.